talking about time today and what we all say too much, we don't have time uh, and how we can, you know, abolish those excuses and just what we need to do to keep our nose to the grindstone and keep focused. We've got uh, Daryl McKay and Tim Morgan here with us. So we'll start with some introductions. Um, how I'm sure we all know who Tim is. He's been on a webinar with us a couple of times now, but Tim, would you let us know uh, what's your role with Spinezy in the collision repair industry? How did you get it started and what do you do in the industry? I am Tim Morgan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Spinezy Americas. I started this company here for the Spinezy family back in 2012, covering North and South America. I've been in the industry over 46 years, uh, past shop owner, uh, past uh, collision educator, um, and um, a couple of different positions within the collision industry uh, on the equipment side. Amazing. You've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, you, you know what you're doing for sure. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and Daryl, uh, you own your Mako shop in Halifax. Uh, how long have you owned the shop? Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the industry as well. Uh, well, my name is Daryl McKay. Uh, we've actually just celebrated our 27th anniversary uh, this past May. Um, how I got involved in the industry is probably like a large percentage of our Text is uh, my father opened a body shop and I went to work in the family business. So uh, my father had a sales background. He worked a little bit in the automotive industry on the fastener end of it. And uh, I think he was working for people, helping build businesses and then seeing the value and of opening his own business. So that's what he did. And then I kind of was in the grade 11, I think, when that came to fruition. And uh, 27 years later, here we are. So <laughs> Awesome. So when did you take over from your dad? Uh, well, we opened originally in May of 90, uh, 94. Um, when we did that, we had the rights to the Nova Scotia region. So we operated our Burnside facility, which is separate from Halifax. We're kind of divided. We're, all, we're, we're, we're close together. We're divided by a harbor, about maybe 20 kilometers away, 15 kilometers away. It's not very far. But uh, that's where our business was. We lived in Dartmouth. That's where we opened our, our shop. Um, we did have the rights for Halifax. Fast forward six, seven years, someone wanted to come in and uh, open a shop in Halifax. We had first right of refusal, so we expanded into the Halifax market. And originally when we expanded in, I, I'd worked in the, the shop for about a year after high school, went back to community college, took accounting and marketing, uh, went back to work at the shop full time. And then the opportunity came in Halifax and we opened more of a satellite location to have a presence on the Halifax side, but kind of to direct uh, work to our Dartmouth facility while at the same time repairing, you know, one, two, and three small, like small panel, small repairs, quick jobs uh, in a little small 3,000 square foot facility. And then uh, come uh, 2005, we kind of moved on from that and we op operated uh, two full fledged facilities, uh, one in Bears Lake, one in Dartmouth. And then again in 2019, we just did our most recent uh, renovation and expansion and equipment purchase. Awesome, yeah, and we'll definitely dive more into that uh, as we go through the webinar. But um, obviously you've been uh, in the industry for a while now, you've owned your own shop for a long time um, and as a franchise shop, but I'll, you probably have a lot of people coming to you saying, or whether it be a tech, a customer, a consultant, an insurer, anyone coming to you saying like, what if you did this one more thing in your business? What if you made this one change? When you hear things like that, when people come to you with sayings like that, what do you, what's your first feeling? Uh, it's like a, it's a two pronged approach. One, the left, the, the voice in the left ear is saying is rolling his eyes subconsciously going, here we go. But at the same time, uh, you know, the voice in my right ear is you have to listen to people. So um, the industry has evolved so much over the last 27 years, you'd, you'd be foolish to think you know everything, you know, like uh, I'm the first one to say, we're not the best at anything. We do our best and we try our best. And uh, if you're not willing to adapt and listen to people, you're probably not gonna uh, be in it for the long haul. And uh, I always felt like I had to kind of go above and beyond to service the customers. I wanted to build a, a good reputation in our marketplace. I feel we've done that. and. Uh, to say that you're not going to listen to people, you have to listen. You can't, you can't drink the Kool-Aid everybody's selling, but you know, once in a while you got to stop and take a sip and, and see what's going on because the changes that have happened in the last 27 years, 
I would say pale in comparison to the changes that have happened in the last seven or eight years in this industry mm -hmm. and what's coming in the next five or seven or eight years in this industry. So it's going to change faster, I think, than most are realizing. Mm -hmm. And as I've tried to get ahead of it, and as much as I am ahead of it, I'm still playing catch up. Yeah, there's always going to so be, I mean, you can't, you can't tune anybody out, I guess. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Sorry. No, no. Yeah. hundred percent. That's, that's a great way to put it. You can't tune anyone out. I love what you said about the Kool-Aid. I mean, that's a great way to put it, but so when you do decide, you take into consideration this process and, you, but what if you decide this is the right process for you, but you don't have the time, the manpower or the resources or what, how do you overcome barriers and figure out how important a change is for your business? Like, how do you figure out, should I implement it? Is it really that important? Um, it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, I am maybe shouldn't be preaching this, but you can't be afraid of change. I, I, I terrified of change. I don't like change, but you have to embrace it. Um, you have to be able to manage a personality in the shop or techs are younger versus the techs that are in the trade now versus compared to the guys that have been in for a number of years. Um, to say you don't have the power, the time to, to make a change or the manpower, at the end of the day, you're going to make those changes. You just have to get over the mindset. It's more of a psychological conditioning that, you know, no matter how busy you are, you're still going to be just as busy whether you make the change or not. Yeah. So have there been any changes in your business that you've made that you've had to like kind of get the whole team on board? And how did you go through that process? Do you have any examples? Um, I mean, it may sound archaic to some, but we've had an opportunity with COVID to kind of change things, how you're, how you're operating your business. You know, we took a mind, uh, after we did a, an upgrade and expansion, we have a couple paint booths, we have a primer booth, but, uh, we strive to do good work, but we were having an issue sometimes with, uh, just to give an example, a bit of overspray on cars and it wasn't overspray from their finishing process that was typically overspray from the repairing process. And we have several mobile prep stations, but we were finding that we were getting little bits of primer on cars and you wouldn't notice it until, you know, you're getting that car detailed. It's two o'clock and the car's going at five and all of a sudden you had to buff a side of a car you weren't anticipating. So mm -hmm. we just made a change that everything going forward is going to be primed in a, in a paint booth. So we have a dedicated primer booth for the shop. doesn't matter if it's a bumper, it's like a six inch round, area you're spraying or if it's a whole car or a side of a car we got tired of making the same mistakes and not making any changes and it was creating havoc because the, it was putting extra pressure on the on the staff on the detailers and the paint side um, they were upset with the body department the body department's trying to do me a favor and get the cars produced quicker um, but it was just, we had to change our process because we were shooting ourselves in the foot. So mm -hmm. the biggest thing, if you're going to make a change, I found is, is it's, you have to implement it and you have to stay the course and you have to drive it home for at least 30 days. Like, and the best way to do that is to, in my opinion, implement a change and get the staff to buy into the point where they believe it's their idea. And, and a lot of, some of these changes are the staff's ideas, believe it or not. But we really hammered home the fact that there's nothing getting sprayed until it's in a primer booth. And uh, we implemented that. Now it's second nature. The guys know we've actually sped our process time up because we're spending less time trying to get the car cleaned. I mean, the detailing process of a car is a pretty important thing when you're doing the delivery. And if you're spending extra hours, you're not anticipating. It just, it made the process a lot um, smoother for us and less frustration for the staff. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm, that makes sense. It may not have the best analogy, but just one of the things we implemented in the last little while. So there's absolutely no, nothing being sprayed on the floor. anymore. It's mm -hmm. all in a dedicated spot. Okay. Gotcha. So when you're making a change, whether it be that overspray with the primer in the booth or whatever the change may be, are you looking at a return on your dollars with this implemented, implemented change? Or are you looking that like, Oh, I just know this will improve my business. How do you justify it? Sometimes you don't see the, the benefit of it right away. Like sometimes you make a change in your shop and it's not necessarily going to put a 
a set figure to your bottom line, but if it improves a process that streamlines a process, it, it the job goes smoother. Um, if you streamline your process, if you, if you um, make the changes properly, it's a more of a long-term gain mm -hmm. and you'll see the, the payoff, you know, longer term, I guess it's like an investment. You don't notice your, when you buy your RSP right away, but you cash it in and, 30, 40 years time, there's a lot of value built into it. So you, it's more so if you improve your process, you're going to, you're going to streamline your, your, your processes. You're going to make the cycle times that much better. You're going to get the cars in and out quicker. You're going to keep your customers happier. So mm -hmm. it's a domino effect. It's not really, it's not necessarily effect. return. Like some things will put yeah. money in your pocket. Other things make the, uh, I'm trying to find the, the easiest way, not the easiest way, but the, 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 the best way to get through the week with the least amount of obstacles that you have to battle and oh, make smart decisions and get through it that way. So. Yeah. For you, it's not, it's not about money. You're not thinking about that. Like, Oh, if I do this more dollars in my pocket, it's more about, you know, how we can. Well, the like dollars. an example would be um, a piece of equipment I recently purchased was uh, an air conditioning recharge system for the, one, two, three, four, YF. We were losing time. We get a car in, not realize right away that, oh, geez, it has a refrigerant in it. It's, we have we had a regular, you know, our 134A machine. Well, that has to go to the dealer. So you can't tow, sometimes you can't drive the car or you have to pay someone to drive the car. There's a liability moving it. So you're towing a vehicle to a dealer. You lose, you don't have your hands in that car anymore. You lose a little bit of control for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you don't know what's on their end. They could have, you know, Joey called in sick and can't do the AC that day. So you're delayed by a day and then you lose three days on a job. So having, it's not that that machine is going to necessarily put money in my pocket. It's going to be a while before I, I pay off the, the money I recoup from it. It'll be a long time before I pay that machine off, but it makes the process easier. Mm -hmm. um, I don't lose time on it. I have the equipment. Um, you can get that vehicle into a repair stall a lot faster if it doesn't have to leave your facility. So that's just maybe one example. It's it's not gonna make me money. It's just gonna save me time. And sometimes if you save time, that's gonna put more yeah. results into your bottom line than the latest and greatest tool. Yeah, gotcha. As they say, time is money. Um, fantastic. So obviously we've had a period of slowdowns for the last uh, 15 or so months. Things look brighter, hopefully, but we're not here to talk about COVID, but uh, are there any ideas that you've been looking to implement in your shop for however long it may be, or they're just sitting in the back of your mind, but you just haven't been able to get to them? And why haven't you been able to get to them? Um, the biggest thing I want to implement right now, like we're a constant work in progress. So I'm not claiming to be the best at anything. But I think Tim would agree, we've made a significant investment in, in tooling and equipment. And uh, me and Tim have talked for several years. This hasn't just been the rash decision. This has been a long process. Tim's helped me through it. Um, I kind of believe I got a, for lack of a better term, I got a race car that can compete on any racetrack. Mm -hmm. I just got to build the team behind it. So I have the tooling and equipment. So the biggest thing for me is going to be product and procedural training and i want to go the route of certification so we're getting all our staff into the icar you know we're, we're gonna our goal is to be icar gold by the end of the summer um we're going after manufacturer certifications you you can't buy the equipment and then not do the training mm -hmm. and then think you're done so we kind of just realized that you know right now there's a downturn and you got to take the positives when you can and and covid's not a positive for anybody but the reality is it's bought us a bit of time to do, get those things done that you didn't think you had time to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's really what we're looking at. I mean, there's always going to be equipment you have to buy because something's going to change or a new technology is going to come out in two years time and it's going to force you to adapt. But the biggest thing right now is getting the people trained to use the equipment to its best capabilities that we've already purchased. And uh, that's where iCar comes in. That's where Tim and Spinezy come in too. Like we hire a new tech and maybe not in the last month, just with the restrictions with travel, but, or last year, I should say, but whenever I needed somebody, I had somebody there to show us how to do the measuring system, how to use the benches, how to 
make the fixtures, how to, so it's been really good that way. Yeah, because that happens so often that you hear shops get the tool and it just sits in the corner collecting dust because nobody teaches them how to use it. So yeah, gotcha. I'm glad to hear you guys are taking advantage of that because obviously the last thing you want to do is spend thousands of dollars on a tool and then never touch it. But um, on the topic of tools, um, you re- mentioned earlier in the show that you did some renovations, some additions and stuff in the last couple of years. So with the new equipment and whatnot that you've gotten, what are uh, what's the single piece of equipment or your favorite piece of equipment that you feel brings the most value to your business? Um, it's hard to really say. <laughs> <laughs> they all complement each other. The I'll answer from two perspectives. The piece of equipment that's allowed me to get paid for things that I wouldn't have got paid for in the past is the touch measuring system. I can perform measurements. I can get a vehicle in. I can do a, um, you know, you get the back bumper off or the front end off or whatever you're measuring. You, you do your measurements. You can, you can save that measurement in the system. You can recall it at any time. You can move the car outside, move it back in when you need. So whenever we, we would, sometimes you get a, an insurance appraisal and they'd say, you know, tie down and pull rad support. Well, you can actually justify some of your times and charges when you can prepare a plan and say, look, this vehicle is bent at this point, this point, this point, this is what we needed to correct it. Once you document it and you can with that measuring system, because it gives you, you know, before and after you can monitor the pull as you do it. Um, that's been able to get me paid for things that I probably wouldn't have gotten paid for in the past because there was no way to really document and show what you had to do. Mm-hmm. The piece of equipment that's maybe the most productive for me is the multi benches. Um, I think they're incredible. Uh, they go from, you know, if you don't have anything to work on, you park a car on it. If the next car comes in and you need to get it up in the air, you can, it's a lift, you can detrim a vehicle, you can take it apart. Oh, look, there's damage. Now we can put a tower on it. We can get a pull on it. Um, if you have to set it up, you know, say you're a Honda shop and you have to anchor it in six spots, you can take the fixtures from the 106 and put it on the multi bench. So the, the piece of equipment that the staff loves the most, that's been most um, productive, most, I guess, uh, production friendly for the staff would be the multi bench. Mm-hmm. I think that's where they made their most money. The thing that's been best for me from getting paid on an actual repair would be the touch measuring system because you can you can justify it. They complement each other, but the more productive my staff are at the end of the day, the more profitable I'm going to be. So those two pieces of equipment are probably the two go-tos for me. Gotcha. I mean, we kind of covered this a little bit, but um, more on the touch measuring system and how do you maximize the usage of that or even the multi-bench? Um, it's for my shop, it's the, it's production friendly. So Mm -hmm. let's say you went with another competitor and you would have, you may have a a fixture bench that's not being used most of the time. And when you need it, you need it. But what I like with their spin easy stuff is that I can, I can have, you know, you have eight body stalls, you put a car in a stall, you're not limited to what you can do in one stall with it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if that so, answers yeah. the question or not. But, uh, no, yeah, for sure. This is versatility. I mean, it's interesting to see that you, I mean, it really helps you get paid for things that you weren't getting paid for before. I mean, that's obviously crucial uh, as a collision repair shop. But and, and truthfully, actually, one of the other, the main ad- benefits of this equipment is like, I've been, this was not a rash decision. I've, you know, been criticized to moving too slow in the past, but I analyzed things down to the nth, the nth you know, right down to the finest points. And for me, their products was most complimentary to my business because it gives me a range of uh, uses without being dedicated into one particular stall. And then the second part of that is, you know, I got a pretty nice sandbox with lots of new toys here. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily help me, it's helped recruit staff Maybe not the techs that are 50 plus because they're kind of on the tail end of their careers. They're looking more for an exit strategy. But those techs that are in their 20s and 30s, they come in and they see state-of-the-art equipment, you know, dedicated for, I guess, universal fixtures, um, 
welders, the, the benches, the measuring system, all that stuff, it really does help you attract good talent because the team that they're on may have a tram gauge and a, you know, a P4 system in the corner and they're kind of, it's easier to kind of recruit some of those younger staff. And, and, and uh, um, I find people are more motivated to be part of a team when you're state of the art. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially like you're saying with the younger techs, it's definitely a key point, but on the other side of things, what pieces of equipment do you feel aren't bringing value, value to your business? And what do you feel like you can do to remedy the issue? Um, I mean, there's, I've wasted money on lots of stuff over the years, but haven't we all? <laughs> um, it's, I don't, I don't know if there's a single piece of equipment that's caused me there's pieces of equipment you don't use every day, mm -hmm. but you need to have them when you need them. So, you know, you may not um, need a, a self-piercing rivet gun to change a box out in an F-250, but when you need it, you need it. So mm -hmm. that piece of equipment isn't used on a daily basis, sometimes not even on a weekly basis, but then you could go two or three weeks where you got three or four box side changes in a row and it gets used and then it goes mm -hmm. into a cupboard. So there's no, I don't know, Every piece of equipment has a value. It's just having it to utilize it in the right time and the right um, space. And sometimes things get used more than others. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally get that. Um, in terms, I mean, I hate to be more negative here too, but obviously we've been experiencing a, I hate to say, you know, never, a never before seen unprecedented. We've been hearing these words for months now, but uh, there's obviously a lot of bottlenecks before the pandemic because of the pandemic. There's a lot of things going on, but what are some of the bottlenecks that you're feeling are taking uh, away from your business? You know, they're, they're breaking down processes. Are there any things that you're running into right now? Challenge wise. <laughs> there's nothing but challenges, to be honest. Um, it's been a difficult 18 months, but as negative as COVID is, you know, maybe my brother helped me with this. He's located in the Burnside shop, but you got to find the positives in the negative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess we looked at it from the point of view. What's the biggest, like something that's eating up time right now, like something that's wasting your time in the shop or something that you're like, oh my gosh, not this again, like a problem that's breaking down the processes. I know parts are obviously an issue right now. Well, the parts, parts issues is one thing. Um, that is a huge, a huge barrier, like no shops at capacity right now. Mm -hmm. So shops are producing cars quicker. Okay. There's, there's not a backlog of, I, maybe there is, I, I don't see it in my marketplace, but I don't think any shop is booking three weeks out. You know, mm -hmm. most shops, they, from what I hear and what I see are, they're usually done by Wednesday or Thursday. Um, we've been fortunate to stay steady for the most part. Um, we, we stayed steady over COVID. And when we did have slow times, we, we, reno we painted, we renovated, we tidied up. But um, I'm kind of rambling here and lost my train of thought. But No, yeah, like, um, I just bottlenecks. I mean, there's so, I mean, like you said, it's constant. There's just challenges, hurdles that you're always jumping through. But well, parts, I like, parts are hard to get just because of supply and demand. So you might have a car that you can produce in four days, but the quarter panels three weeks out of Germany. Yeah. So that's the, that's the biggest frustration right now. It's not doing the work. Um, it's not, it's more so lack of vehicles on the road because things are beyond your control. The government puts in restrictions. Um, they do lockdowns. So, you know, stay at home, don't drive. Well, obviously we're in a business that involves cars and usually they get damaged from moving around. So when you're, you're told not to uh, move around. That's one thing. But then when you do get that work and you can't produce it because of other factors, that's, that's the biggest frustration right now is like we waited 200 days for a, a roof skin to come in on a, on a vehicle. I won't say the product or the vehicle, but you know, 200 days to get a roof is, is kind of unacceptable no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. So that would be the biggest uh, variable right now that's impacting us to do work. When we get a job, we can get it in and produce it like most other shops can right now. But it's when you're restricted to the supplies and materials that are needed for the job, that's probably the biggest uh, hurdle we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, sorry, Tim, we've just kind of had you sitting there listening all this time, but let's, 
let's get you into the conversation now. Um, so obviously you've heard all of this from Daryl. You've worked with Daryl in the past, but you've heard his bottlenecks. You've heard the processes and how he implements things. But how do you begin addressing bottlenecks as a shop owner who feels that they already are like being smothered by packed work already? Well, Daryl and I started that conversation probably back in 2017 before he even did his uh, remodel. Uh, and he was trying to figure out a better way to have flow and a better processes in place so he didn't have the bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's where, um, I mean, he's seen the touch measuring system at the at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. We were doing a demonstration there. Right. And showed how, <laughs> yeah, how to pre-qualify a car for the repair. So if I pre-qualify that car first, I know what technician needs to be able to in my you know, in my drawer of technicians, I know if I need an A tech, a B tech, or a C tech to be able to take on this repair. I'm going to find that extra damage on that core support or something that may not have been noted. Uh, and that we're no longer pulling and squaring a front end. We're actually documenting where in the rail it, the damage is or where on the apron or where on the core support and adding that time to the estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, because we've pre qualified all this we're saving time. Uh, where, where people buying equipment always thought of my return on investment being cash, you need to really uh, look at your return on your time investment. If I invest into, as Daryl did it in, in multi benches besides his, uh, his large bench, every single vehicle goes on those multi benches. So if a bumper has to be changed, the technician is working standing up. He's not on the ground. He's not getting fatigued. Uh, so they're implementing. Uh, and one of the things you say when you try it, when someone's trying to sell you something, Daryl, what do you think you're going to get? One of the things I brought to his attention is our past experience with the multi bench is we're going to give you about a 20% increase of flow when you're using those because just the time savings you're going to give to the technician from not being on the floor or not having to move the car to a traditional frame rack because not only is it a platform to be able to take the car apart, put the car back together, uh, put parts on, put parts off, but I can make a pool with it also uh, mm -hmm. because it does have a pulling tower. It does have arms and clamps. So we work through a lot of the bottlenecks that he had um, and was facing every day to be able to get him to grow. Gotcha. So, I mean, clearly it's a very one-on-one -on -one process with the shop owners, but Tim, you've got experience um, running a shop. Uh, when you ran your own collision repair facilities, how did you manage these process improvements when you were already feeling so weighed down by the time? And how did you drive the return on invested dollars? That was a long, long time ago. The body shop today is nowhere near what it was in the 80s. Uh, you start to look at production, different things like that. Cars used to sit, sit around. There was poor color matching back in the, those days. Um, the body shop is nowhere near uh, what it was when I, uh, when I actually had my own shop. But growing through the positions that I've grown through, uh, working in the industry, working with every shop owner uh, individually, uh, we like to sit down and what see what plans the shop owner has or what their goals are, not just today. We're not there just to sell them a piece of equipment today. I was actually at a shop in Oregon last week that we have three phases we're putting together for over the next three to four years to plan out to get them where they wanna end up because you gotta walk before you can run. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the economy the way it is today, um, sometimes you have to implement things in, in pieces. So you look at, where can I get my most bang for my buck? Well, with Daryl, first thing was the measuring system. We get a measuring system in there and we get that being productive and that returning time on your investment. Then now we can move to the next step and then it just goes from there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, it's a very personalized system. I mean, it all depends on obviously, you just want them to reach their goal. Um, so obviously with, like you mentioned, you're working with shop owners across North America. Is there a common theme that ever comes up in conversations when you're talking about shop investments? Um, not just talking equipment, but just business in general. Is there a common theme in these conversations? Well, first, first of all, they need to, as Daryl's talking about, make sure that their technicians are happy. 
Um, and a lot of technicians are used to or comfortable with certain brands that are out there. Um, but those brands may not offer the same objectives or the same outcome that something that we might offer. Uh, so we have to spend some time explaining, you know, why we do the processes that we do, why our equipment does what it does. But one unique thing about Spinezy that uh, where we're over the competition is we actually still have our own operating body shop in Italy. So when we design pieces of equipment, it's gone through a production process to make sure it's going to do what it needs to do. Um, you know, and sometimes we go back and, and redesign from, you know, ideas from, you know, the industry or ideas from an OEM or ideas from uh, a customer um, or, you know, in our own in our own shop because they're producing cars every day in that body shop. It's open six days a week. So uh, it's a high volume production shop. It's not a prototype type shop. Yeah, gotcha. So, I mean, there's clearly, gotcha, lots of testing and whatnot involved, but, and change obviously is a huge driver of all of the tools and equipment and just everything in the industry. So, and like we were talking about before, a lot of these technicians, we, we do have a labor shortage in Canada. A lot of technicians and business owners in the industry are um, upwards of 55 years old. And I've been working in the industry for 35, 40 years. So what would you say to someone that's been, that comes to you and says, well, I've been doing this the same way for 35 years and I don't have any issues. What do you say to them? Um, unfortunately, they're probably doing it wrong or, or they're tripping over pennies where they could be collecting dollars because they haven't made an investment to be able to uh, have the right piece of equipment that's going to save them time or show them where there's more time or show them where they can collect more time. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time, not just with the technicians, but also with uh, the managers and owners to make sure that they know what they should be requesting from the tech. Uh, or, and we really like the owners and managers to take some of the tech training. I, I take the training. <laughs> I want to know, because then how do I, how do I know if I'm being fed a line of, you know what, you know, but uh, that's one thing with Tim, that's if you want the training, you can get it to, uh, Sorry to jump in there, but no, no, absolutely. I want the training as much or more than the than the text, to be honest with you. So, mm -hmm. and at the same time, you have a better direction when you know how things operate. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have your. I mean, yeah, exactly. So, if we got down to the chase, our shops repairing cars correctly right now. If there's those 35 year people that refuse to make changes and whatnot, our cars getting repaired by the general industry properly. If I base this answer on what I see on social media, I'd have to say no. Mm. How do you uh, feel about that? Sorry, go ahead, Tim. I'll ask Daryl afterwards. I, like I said, if I if I base it on what I see on social media, I'd have to say no. I see a lot of um, scary things happening on the, on you know being posted on you know the the social media sites. But um, I would hope that as a shop owner, they were looking to do the right, correct repair. Um, you need to be pulling procedures. Um, you need to be following those procedures. Some of them will require special tools. Um, but there are those instances out there where uh, someone hasn't had the training or someone doesn't want to change. Um, you start to look at some of the things that are being repaired structurally that probably should be replaced. But then, then again, you're, you just heard Daryl a few months or a few minutes ago talk about how he had to wait over 200 days for a roof. Um, is that something that with the proper tool, it could be repaired, uh, say with our, our pull up uh, glue system or something. Uh, so we can see where we would repair something instead of replacing it. So those are all kinds of different decisions that have to be made, but um, I'll let Daryl finish this one up. Yeah. So how do you feel about that question, Daryl? Do you feel like people are repairing cars correctly? Oh, yes and no. Um, I think for the most part, there, there's not a lot of shops that are trying to butcher cars. Oh, yeah. um, the truth of the matter is, and I can't sit here and talk to you guys without saying, you know, I've, I've made mistakes too, mostly because I didn't have the training and the education. But the last several years, we've invested in that training and education. So I think some of those mistakes are not necessarily malicious by nature, just due to lack of knowledge. You know, we probably have repaired cars incorrectly. I mean, I can sit here and preach how great we are but the reality is i'm honest and at the end of the day you don't know what you don't know so if you want to be in this industry moving forward like 
I'm going to steal a quote from somebody, but Gabbard will like it, but we're in a paradigm shift. Like it truth truly is uh, what's happening with cars in the last five years. It's changed more in five years than it did the previous 20 Mm -hmm. and what's coming ahead. So yes, cars haven't been fixed properly. I think everybody's been um, part of that process, but with the technology that's available and even social media, like 20 years ago, there was no Facebook to go online and see how something should be done or get bounce an idea or, or get opinions from people. But technology is changing to the point that you have to train. And with the materials changing on cars so quick that if you don't train and you don't invest in equipment, you're probably opening yourself up for a lawsuit. Yeah, that, that leads into the next question. I mean, for, for Tim, if you... If someone refuses to change, can you help them if they don't want to? Or what do you do in that situation? Same thing you do in a relationship. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, you no, know, you, a lot of people are trying to still do the, you know, their business. Hey, I've done it this way for 30 years. I don't need to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, but as Daryl said, the cars aren't made that way. I've seen materials, uh, steel materials change in a in the same model vehicle, I've seen those materials change sometimes three times in a, in a one year period. So yeah. um, you're almost down to having to look at repair procedures by VIN them. Yeah, uh, I've heard that too. Yeah, procedures is, is the big thing. Like any, you're supposed to pull a procedure in every car, some of those minor cookie cutter bumper repairs. Um, obviously we do a lot of scanning, but once you get into cutting a vehicle apart, like you better have the procedure at your fingertips because you're, you're one, one little mistake away from creating a lot of grief for yourself yeah. if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, once, you that, repaired, once you repaired that vehicle, you pretty much own. You, you own it. Like yeah. it's following you around. And yeah. uh, that's what like, scares, I think, a lot of shop owners, at least me. There's people that are older that are just looking for an exit strategy. I don't have anywhere to go. I'm 44. I got 20 more years in this industry. I got to just, if I'm going to stay in it, I got to kind of try and be towards the cutting edge of it. So. Absolutely. Leads into our next question. Obviously we've seen a lot of OEM certification. OEM has been a big topic lately. I mean, in the last 10 years even, but do you see them as both of you? This is a question for both of you. We'll start with Tim, but are OEM certifications the latest fad or, and do they really mean anything or are they here to stay? No, they're here to stay. Uh, I just the, what we've been discussing. I mean, making sure the vehicle is repaired properly. Mm-hmm. If you see a couple of vehicle manufacturers right now, they're even self-insuring or starting to self-insure their own vehicles. And that's basically so that they can make sure that the vehicles repaired a correct way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, to protect the, their customer. Uh, so yes, they want to, uh, you know, make sure that they're, you know, doing the right job on their car. So OEMs are here to stay. Yeah. And Daryl, you'd agree with that. Are you pursuing OEM certifications as well? Yeah, that's, that's, we have to be the best version of ourselves that we can. There's right, wrong, or indifferent. There's barriers in place. Um, Not necessarily what you know, but who you know. So I've invested in equipment to try and knock down those barriers. And I don't think the manufacturers are going to, with the, like the, the tech and technician has never been more prevalent than today. Um, before you could be a bodyman, but nowadays with these cars, you're, you're technicians. And I, I don't think the manufacturer side of it's gonna back off and hate to say it, even if it did, are you still not gonna train from what the manufacturer's telling you how to fix their car? It's, it's they designed it, you gotta know how to repair it. So I, I, don't, I don't foresee, Tim would probably have better insight than me, but I don't think it's gonna go away and if it does, it won't be anytime soon. So you might as well jump in with both feet. So. Agreed. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing. The general industry, too. This is to get and it legitimizes you too. Like if you're a customer, if you're Mr. Jones, and you're driving whatever vehicle you're driving, whether it's a Volkswagen or a Honda or a Mercedes or whatever it is you're driving, you made a big investment in that car. People are more apt to look around and 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 hey, what's going to happen to my car? So when you've met the, the criteria from the manufacturer's end, it just, if anything, it'll drive more value to your door because I'm not sure everyone will jump in the manufacturer route. I think some shops will disappear. And if you can position yourself properly, there's better opportunity for you down the road. But again, it's not a, 
it's not a tomorrow solution. You know, I'll probably reap the rewards of this in the next 24 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, I mean, just getting the OEM seal and having that OEM uh, sticker doesn't mean that you're a hundred percent there. No, it's just a longer process, but I think it's a, I think that's the way, I think that's the highway they're building right now that you have to drive, so. Well, and, and one other thing, when you look at it too, um, studies have shown that after someone's been in an accident, they trade that car in probably within the next six to 18 months. Um, so the OEMs want them to come back to that brand. They surely do not want them to go to a different brand because when they were in an accident, the shop had such a hard time repairing the car. Mm -hmm. so, I think there's a lot of uh, investment on the OEM side to be able to make sure their cars are being repaired correctly uh, to keep the consumer. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we kind of talked about OEM for a little bit there, so, uh, but it's an important topic. So we're nearing the end of the session now, just to the audience, um, uh, the end of our questions for Tim and uh, Daryl. So feel free to start asking questions in the Q&A. If you have any questions, comments in the Q&A or the chat box, either or we'll see them. So make sure you get your questions in because we'll spend the last 15 minutes or so talking about those. Um, but to kind of close it off with our last question, uh, obviously we've been talking about change this entire time, but let's talk strategies for success for the next five to 10 years or so. If I was a shop owner, where would I need to position myself to stay in business and be profitable? For me or? I think that's a question for Tim. We'll start with Tim, but then if we can move over to Daryl for feedback as well. Okay. Well, if you, if you look at moving forward in the future, we need to be more productive. Uh, um, as you said, we have a shrinking labor pool. We need to look at that. Um, more people are leaving the business than are getting back in. Mm -hmm. We need to attract some better candidates, I, I believe would say. So we all need to work with the... Um, with our trade schools, we need to work with uh, our high schools, um, and even earlier than that, to, to attract people into our business. Mm -hmm. uh, having the right equipment in your facility is gonna attract the right quality of uh, yeah. employees, as Daryl has already mentioned. Um, I, I know uh, Daryl and I, when we had a conversation a, a week or so ago, he's, um, he says he has one problem in his facility, and, he, and the problem is that one of the technicians doesn't have a multi-bench and he's seeing the other two that do. So left out. Yeah, he's feeling left out. So he's like, hey, I can be more productive if you get me one too. So sometimes you end up with those types of situations. But uh, um, I think for the most part, we're gonna see a little bit of restructuring on the MSO side of what's being done in business um, and the franchising a little bit possibly um, but we're still going to have lots of shops out there. Uh, mm -hmm. again, as Daryl mentioned, you're going to have those that are, you know, looking for a way out retirement or something easier, um, because it's getting harder and harder every day and the investment is larger. So mm -hmm. Daryl, you'd agree with that? Yeah. I mean, from the original question by me again, sorry. Yeah, yeah just uh, what are you- Listening, just, not thinking. No, 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 I got to, totally get it. Uh, just where would you need to position yourself for the next five to 10 years to not only just stay in business and stay alive, but be profitable? Honest answer is don't know. <laughs> but I feel and I've committed and I've invested and I've gambled that the path I'm on is probably the path I'm going to stay on. Mm -hmm. and uh i'm kind of all in on this and uh i don't i could be wrong like industry can change prime example things can change right in front of you with covid like how you operate now versus how you operated 18 months ago is different so um i believe that the path forward is probably not going to change that much from the manufacturer side so that's the that's the road i'm taking and right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what I'm doing. So that's kind of where I'll continue to do. It's hard, it's expensive, and, and it's frustrating, and you scratch your head sometimes, but what, 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 what other option do you have? Yeah, at the end of the day, this is the business, and we all do love it at the end of the deep down. <laughs> 
Okay. So um, those are all the questions that we had, but we've got some questions already rolling into the Q&A here. So um, just before we launch into all that, I just want to thank Tim and Daryl both for your uh, thoughtful conversation here. It was just very good to get all those questions answered. You know, get the, uh, I'm sure this is all a topic that everyone's feeling. We don't have time. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. I'm, I'm going to thank you again at the end. But uh, before we get into questions, um, we've got one person here saying, my shop has been busy. We never really slowed down here at all. We struggled to find time to do absolutely anything. Where can I start getting time back in my processes? Well, I think if I, if Daryl, if I can take that and then you can yep. add to it, um, you need to look at your processes and are they long and drawn out or is there a way to make them easier? Uh, adding a measuring system so that uh, my tech's not stumbling through the repair and the panels are going to fit right the first time instead of having to go back and re-repair. Um, as Daryl mentioned about his, um, you know, his AC machine, he was sending it out. So when I, when I send a vehicle out, I have to send drivers out and probably a, a, a driver and a, someone to pick that person up. So I have people leaving the shop. So I'm losing labor time. Um, which I gain back if I did that process in-house. Um, adding, um, I'm not just going to say because of our brand name, but adding a lift, uh, uh, such as like our multi-bench, um, the tech's going to be able to get through a repair faster and easier because he's not down on his hands and knees. He's mm. not under a car on the floor scraping around. He's actually getting um what he needs to uh you know he's working in an ergonomic situation uh and when you look at all the things that are changing in electronics you're going to need to go even farther mm -hmm. absolutely and i know that uh those were topics that you talked about daryl too as well as offering things in-house that's a big thing that you've been trying to strive towards as well just little things like i hate to say it, you send a car out well the ac and then this is just real life example sometimes you forget you sent it out <laughs> and then you got to go get it like it's I know it sounds ridiculous to sit on the uh, form like this and admit some of these things but yeah like you get so busy you got so many irons in a fire I, I think you know back to the question uh, some to, to answer that question where can I get some of my time back it's a two-part it's a mindset and then you have to actually invest in things that'll help you you know it's if you've got a job that's going to pay you well but you don't have a car and you take the bus, you know, and if the bus isn't available, then you got to find a way to get a car to get to that job. So if you're in this industry, you've got to invest in some tools and equipment like those multi benches. Uh, you know, I don't get a commission for this. I'm not getting paid. I'm just being honest, have improved my tech's performance. The measuring system has put money in my pocket for things that I normally wouldn't have gotten paid for. So from the, the point of view is you'll never have enough time you're always busier than you, you're, you're, you think you're busier than you really are. You're going to be just as busy and just as stressed. So you have to kind of just embrace it and know that it's going to be turbulence in your brain and you have to sort through all the mental diarrhea and you get through it, but you, you invest in the, the tooling and equipment and then just take the mindset and really give yourself a chance with it. And I think you'll find you're going to gain a little bit in each area where all of a sudden after six months, you go, wow, that, that was smoother. Maybe let's stay on this track and kind of keep the, the ball rolling. And that's kind of what we did. And right, you know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just what we did. So. Mm -hmm. so Kevin Cox, one of our viewers, weighed in on that. He said, I find recently, well, not recently, but just I find there's more and more admin time, more and more instructions from insurance, documentation, parts pricing. And that's an area where he finds he needs to free up his time. Any comments on that? Without getting too. Yeah. <laughs> We rest our case. <laughs> it's cool. It's the reality of it, though. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, so another question we've got uh, here from another we've got. Um, I'm thinking about adding a tech just to do electronics. How do I even bill for that when they aren't paying me for the body work? Doesn't sound like you're billing it correctly. Um, and you have mechanical time there and it's a mechanic. So I believe that that gets billed out differently. Mm -hmm. um, if they took the vehicle to a dealership or to a service shop, they would be paying for it. So I don't see any reason why they shouldn't pay for it now. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that. All right. 
Next one, I've worked with my tax to change processes to become more efficient. Then I turn around and they just go back to the old ways. What do I do to keep them on track? Daryl, you could definitely speak to this with your overspray issue. <laughs> well, sometimes you're going to make it, I don't want to talk about an employee the wrong way, but you got to make it think it's their idea and they have to, to see the benefit in order to buy into it. So, you know, and then you have to reinforce it, you know, tell Joe, tell Bob, tell Samantha, Hey, no, this is the way it is going. I know it's what we did, but you know, <laughs> I have a lot of terrible analogies, but I've, I've struggled with weight my whole life mm -hmm. and no one wants to go on a diet, but once you're on that diet, and you start eating better and you're going to the gym after you get through that first month it becomes mental conditioning it's conditioned that's your new that's your new reality that's your new process so as frustrating as it is for the shop owner or the manager who's ever managing that tech that says back to the old ways you do you cannot let that happen it's you just got to keep your foot on the gas and and th they will event and, and if they don't comply well then you got the wrong person it's time to part ways with that guy because or or girl or whoever but it, it's that's going to affect your business mm -hmm. but if you can keep your foot on the gas and just without being a dictator and 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 condition that response that's the only way to do it because everyone listen we weren't into again to my analogy about priming cars oh it's only a bumper come on it's just a, it's just a small spot it's such a waste of time. No, i don't care mm -hmm. i'm tired of listening to my fred complain that he has to buff half a car because the tech was trying to make an extra couple hours and get it prime before he went home and didn't cover the car properly. So just things like that. You have to, if you're going to make a change, you're only kidding yourself if you don't enforce it and, and really drive it home for that first three or four weeks, because that's really the conditioning phase from my perspective. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's like really building a culture. You, um, and it's in any business, not just in the collision business. There's always going to be change, and you just, as as Daryl says, you got to you got to direct your group and how we can, um, you know, how we can work together to get to the next goal. Uh, and sometimes in there, you got to add some incentives. When they start to see that, it saved them time uh, in the overall repair process. Um, they're going to do it every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just all about like exactly like you said, Daryl, keeping your foot on the gas, mental conditioning. I mean, all of that. It sounds bad when you say mental conditioning, but it's what it is. Like, yeah, it's not like a Pavlov's dog situation. We're no, not doing it's just, that. <laughs> if you allow yourself to never change, you're never going to change. So you just have to make it happen. And it sucks. I hate change. Anyone mm -hmm. that knows me is watching this going, he's full of it. <laughs> but <laughs> the reality is, you got to change. And if you're not willing to, you're going to get left behind. Exactly. All right, we've got another question here from Steve Selly. He says, what do you do in scenarios where insurance companies do not want to abide by OEM recommendations and position statements? It's a loaded question. Yeah, that is a loaded question because how could you repair a car any different than the way that the OEM is telling you to repair it? Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to involve the customer too. To yeah. let them know. A lot of times things get said to shops from uh, one part of the industry that doesn't necessarily get said to the policyholder. Yes. Um, and sometimes if you educate a customer, customers aren't stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, if you educate that customer properly, they'll, they'll fight with you. Um, and I don't want to imply that we have major problems and, and, and it's all negative on that side of it. But a lot of times you educate a customer, sometimes a customer will want to pay that extra as opposed to putting an aftermarket hood on a car. They, they'll pay that extra couple hundred bucks to go with the OEM hood if you, if you can justify and, and show them the the benefits to it mm -hmm. that's definitely a topic we've been discussing lately too in the magazine and just in general industry i mean customers nowadays they're so in tune with adas they know what the car does but do they really know how sensitive those things are and all of the different processes that are required by oem so an excellent point there daryl well and you just brought up the the the, the words adas i mean that's going to totally change the aspect of what anybody's doing on a vehicle mechanically Mm -hmm. uh, when they have to recalibrate for windshields when they have to, uh, you know, recalibrate mirrors. It's all things that the insurance company uh, never had to pay for before, but now it's a process. It mm -hmm. has to be done. There's no way just, to just pull a bumper off of a car now with radar guided cruise control. You know, Absolutely. it's it's back to the dealer. And sometimes it's not just to recalibrate. It's a wheel alignment along with keep re, uh, recalibration to make sure everything's 
in order. And that's a three or $400 bill sometimes <laughs> just because yeah. you unplugged a wire. <laughs> so. Seriously, yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. All righty, we've got another question from Facebook. It's from Jordan Greek. Uh, do you feel quality is being overlooked where everything needs to be in and out so quickly to keep insurance companies happy so you receive more work from them? Well, I'm not a shop owner, but my yeah. answer to that is going to be that um, insurance companies should not dictate how the owner of a business runs his company. Mm -hmm. uh, you have fixed costs um, and those need to be covered. Um, so, um, and if, you know, that insurance company is holding uh, work away from you because you're not getting it done fast enough, then maybe that's not a you know, insurance company that you want to do work with. Um, uh, several of my friends here that are shop owners have gotten away from direct repair uh, contracts and actually increased business with the same insurance companies that they had uh, DRPs with. Yeah. Um, because now they're dictating it their way and working with the customer to show the customer the right way the vehicle has to be repaired. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Perfect. Can you repeat um, that question? Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you feel quality is being overlooked where everything needs to be in and out of the shop so quickly to keep insurance ha companies happy? Who are you working for? <laughs> Who's your customer? <laughs> Yeah, that's keep your customer happy. I mean, that's the reality, like 100%. And I mean, a direct repair program is great, and there's great programs out there. There's terrible programs out there. They're not the be all and end all. Like, we're either, depending on how you look at it, fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to not, we're, we're not a DRP for anybody, but we've been in business 27 years. Mm -hmm. So we've always worked for the customer. And I'm not saying this as a negative, but I didn't concern myself with who is paying the bill. Mrs. Johnson's Toyota Camry or, you know, Mr. McLean's Chevy Silverado, I'm working for him. It doesn't matter if his next door neighbor was paying the bill or if it was, you know, a corporation. It, at the end of the day, you're working for your customer. So I would say focus on keeping your customer happy. And if your customer's happy, <laughs> I think your insurer will be happy. I think it's a ridiculous statistic. Most people switch insurers after a, a claims process. So I think it would be to the insurance company's benefit to have the customer as happy as possible during the process. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. We've got one here from Steve Knox. Uh, he's out in New Brunswick. Uh, is there an incentive for a shop to invest in ADAS? Uh, I don't know if there's how to answer that besides yeah. that you're going to have to be in that business um, or you're going to be, you know, missing a lot of uh, doing, you know, missing a lot of opportunity for work um, because almost every single car, if not every single car is going to have, has some sort of ADAS on it and it's going to require, you know, scanning, resetting, uh, calibrating uh, now already and more even in the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I was just going to ask if the difference is, if, in your personal opinion, or is it's a kind of a case by case basis, would you say it's better to invest in ADAS in house or to contract it out via a third party? I think it depends on the size of the facility mm -hmm. uh, because it does take up a sizable amount of area for certain vehicles to do the calibration. Um, and you're really going to need to have an area that can be dedicated to it. Um, because depending on what system you're using, there may be some lasers involved or something like that, that, um, you know, you have to have an environment that it can operate in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I think those are all the questions we've got here and we're, oh, we're actually right at three o'clock. So, um, if anyone has any last uh, questions that they want to come in, feel free to send them in the chat. Um, we can always send them off to Daryl and Tim afterwards via email. We can answer your questions that way. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to both Daryl and Tim for speaking with us today. I'm sure your insight was much appreciated by our audience, was appreciated by myself here. So thank you both. Um, and we'll see you guys next time for our next Open Dialogue webinar. Our next uh, webinar is scheduled for July 20th. So keep an eye out for our promotions on that. But once again, uh, give a round of applause to Spinezy and Mako Halifax for joining us. And um, be sure to check out Spinezy at spinezy-americas.com. And um, have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Daryl. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Bye-bye.